Yes, so uh, we are very happy to have our own student, Lizzie Kumar. Uh, she's a second year student, with, uh, advised by Suresh. And uh, so she is one of the recipients of this ARCS fellowship and uh, she's, yeah, this is, I guess, her second year here. And uh, she's been doing some cool work on uh, uh, biases in machine learning models and uh, in general, uh, I guess she's going to talk about some methods that deal with uh, feature importance scores and how they have some problematic issues. So we are going to see that. And uh, so this work actually won the best paper award at uh, FACT, which is this Fairness Accounting and Transparency Conference. And uh, yeah, which is actually a really cool thing, especially for like an early grad student. So we're happy to have you here and uh, you know, eager to know more. Go ahead. Cool, thanks for the introduction. Yeah, so this was a joint work with um, my friend Leif Hancox-Lee, who is a data scientist at Capital One right now, I believe, and um, has a PhD in philosophy. Um, and we this, uh, I guess, credit where it's due, the idea for this paper came to me uh, while I was talking, well, I guess to me and Leif while I was talking to him about a paper that he wrote that I was citing in a paper for Mariah's class on um, research methods, uh, human-centered research um, methodologies. So anyway, this is a, a culmination of lots of collaboration. Um, and yeah, this talk is about epistemic values in feature importance methods. So in this talk, I'm going to introduce the idea of feature importance uh, and the idea of epistemic values uh, and explain the inquiry that we're, we conduct in our paper. I'll talk about some of the epistemic values we find to be embedded in feature importance methods, um, namely instrumentalism, universalism, and emphasis of abstraction over context. And finally, I'll offer some suggestions for explainable machine learning researchers that draw from feminist ideas, uh, incorporating subjugated points of view, evaluating explanations in context, interactivity, and seamfulness. So as I'm sure everyone here is sick of hearing, um, machine learning has become an incredibly common method for building automated decision-making tools in research, government, and industry. Um, and once these models are built, it is up to humans to decide whether they trust that model to actually make decisions and after deployment to navigate a world in which that model is making decisions. And as state-of-the-art models become more complicated, more highly parametric, people are increasingly worried about being able to interpret uh, those models so that they can do that kind of evaluation task effectively. Um, and one of the oldest and most common strategies in the growing field of explainable machine learning is simply trying to quantify the relative effects of each of the model's input features. So for our purposes, feature importance is basically just any way of assigning some kind of quantitative importance metric to the input features of some learned function for the, purpose of, for the purposes of interpreting or explaining that function. So in this figure on the right, as you can see, uh, we're given a function of three variables and the problem is to generate an importance score for each of those variables. So certain tools you might have heard of if you're um, interested at all in this space include local or instance specific metrics, which are not just about the global importance of the variable to a model at large, but to try to explain the model's output on a certain input. And so you basically take a single data point uh, along with a function and you try to assign importance of each feature, uh, the importance of each feature to the function with respect to that single instance. Um, so some commonly cited methods in this category include um, what are called LIME or locally interpretable model explanations, SHAP or SHAPLY aggregated explanations with the P in the second letter of that word for some reason, uh, <laughs> gradients and integrated gradients um, and counterfactual explanations, which um, simply sort of contrast uh, the output of a model with um, on a certain instance with the output of a model with something changed about that instance. So another family um, of metrics of this type are global, such as permutation feature importance and genie importance for tree ensembles. Um, and in the field of computer vision, saliency maps are also have part of this category where the features are individual 
pixels of an image. So why am I talking about epistemic values in the context of feature importance? Well, epistemology is the philosophical study of human knowledge and key to any conception of what constitutes a useful interpretation are epistemic values or desirable, desirable qualities of knowledge and understanding within a certain theory of epistemology. And while many feature importance methods are defined and justified in formal or mathematical terms uh, that seem objective, the choices that were made in deciding how to develop or use that tool implicitly embed uh, values of this type. I should also mention, because this is a shorter talk, feel free to just interrupt me and, and ask me questions as I go along. So the lens through which we chose to write this paper and conduct this inquiry was through the lens of feminist epistemology, which grew out of a reaction against scientific claims of unitary knowledge, where largely white and male knowers have constructed one way of seeing as the objective one. So I've included a couple of my favorite quotes from Donna Haraway, who is one of many voices in this movement that I think describe the sort of version of feminist epistemology that um, Leif and I were interested in. Um, so first, feminist objectivity is about limited location and situated knowledge, not about transcendence and splitting of subject and object. Second, relativism and totalization are both God tricks promising vision from everywhere and nowhere equally and fully common myths and rhetorics surrounding science. So here are some examples of things that are valued in feminist epistemology and not every thinker. Oh, Jeff has a question. Um, 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 so I was wondering if you could actually kind of, so go back to those quotes and maybe unpack them a little bit. Yeah, sure. I, 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 there's, there's like so much in, in each of those. Sense that I'm not sure I'm grasping um, everything well, that's why, important. Well, why don't why don't we come out back to it after this slide where I where I try oh, to break okay. it down a little bit. Okay, <laughs> um, okay, so so some examples. Yeah, let's let's go back to it after this. So um, so these are what I guess we call feminist epistemological values, um, and I guess I wanted to point out that not every like feminist philosopher in, would agree with every point here, but it's um, these are ideas sort of generally thought of as, as being under this umbrella. So one idea is uh, pluralism or the idea that knowledge is situated or contextual. There are local, many locally correct truths from different perspectives, which together form a more complete truth, which is opposed to uh, the idea that you can have knowledge from everywhere and nowhere all at once. Does that make sense? So knowledge is like with respect to a perspective. Another idea is uh, standpoint theory or the idea that marginalized individuals are better suited to provide objective accounts of the world because of their unique social position. And another is interactivity, which is the idea that objects of knowledge are not just passive with static properties, but should be considered as agents that can enter into conversation with the knower. So let's see, does this unpack? Uh, yes, limited location and situated knowledge. Yes, and not about transcendence and splitting of subject and object. So this is about how uh, knowledge is with respect to a certain location and that knowledge is then situated within that location, I suppose. And is this by like limited location, does that potentially mean like the perspective of people that location is referring to like a, someone or a group of people's perspective on, on something? Yeah, so like location in society and, you know, your, your position in the world. Yeah. So the point is that since science is done by individuals, um, you know, there's no such thing as a uh, um, a single universal, you know, knowledge, because we're people that each have our own knowledges. So thinking about these values and learning about feminist epistemology, frankly, uh, last spring, uh, while thinking about machine learning explanations, uh, led Leif and I to write this paper by asking the following questions. What are the epistemic values implicit in feature importance methodologies? Are these values in conflict with feminist epistemology 
And if so, can these conflicts help us understand the suitability of feature importance for explanation purposes? And finally, how could we approach explainability to be more aligned with feminist thought? Questions so far? Um, so I have one more question. So the, the, this kind of um, perspective from, so like feminist, um, so ep, epistemology is not specifically about so feminism itself necessarily, but it's it's about a way of thinking that came out of the feminist movement, but applies, you know, to other perspectives. And you're saying, including machine learning. Yes, absolutely. So I guess I I guess I should mention, and, and we sort of get asked this a lot. Like, are these ideas unique to like the theory of feminism? And they're not. Um, but just some, some of the most well-known writers on these ideas are coming out of a sort of feminist perspective on science, like that's sort of their stated uh, intentions, I guess. So we're just sort of like giving credit to where, uh, where we're taking these ideas from in terms of taking it from uh, feminist theory, and, which is different from like the textbook definition of feminism as like the belief that women should be treated equally, right? It's, it's, it's meaning something more specific here. So. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, I should have clarified. <laughs> um, Lizzie, one question. I'm fairly comfortable with these two ideas of pluralism and standpoint theory. Um, I'm a little confused about this definition of interactivity. What What do you mean by an object of knowledge that is an agent? Yeah, so I guess, I mean, the most natural setting for this kind of um, quality is where is in like the social sciences where you're trying to scientifically study like people um, or like social processes. Um, so I guess instead of thinking of yourself as separate from those people, you have to think about like the interactions that you have with the people that you're studying um, and that like you construct, um, like it's those interactions that are constructing your knowledge about those persons. So this applies to like anthropology and, and stuff like that. Um, Great. If that anyone wants sense. to, if anyone else no, wants that, to that jump in, uh, <laughs> I'm looking at you, Thank Daria. You. <laughs> but, <laughs> I feel like anything I'll say will be TMI for. <laughs> sure. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. So. Let's move on. These are our questions. All right, let's talk about the first question. Um, what are the epistemic values at play when feature importance techniques are being developed, proposed, used? So uh, we'll start by giving a brief history of how one epistemic value instrumentalism came to dominate uh, this sort of space. So. Some descriptions of the idea of feature importance uh, mirror this one from the popular book, The Elements of Statistical Learning, which frames feature importance as a tool for feature selection. So this quote says, often only a few of the features you fed into your model have substantial influence on the response. Uh, many are irrelevant and could just as well not have been included. And sort of this is the justification for uh, calculating these feature importance metrics. So, while measuring the importance of a feature to determine whether it should be used in a model of a data of like a data generated process, so like a statistical model, um, that's an old idea. There are lots of ways to do that quantitatively, but using it for interpreting a black box model is a relatively new idea. And in particular, the idea of assigning importance based on predictive performance of a black box model versus a statistical notion of fit was really not a concern until maybe obviously people started being able to extract predictive insights from uninterpretable functions of huge variable sets due to advances in computing. So um, Matthew Jones, who is a um, science and technology scholar at Columbia um, has a paper that I am hoping has come out by now, but was a preprint when we cited it. Um, argues that Leo Bryman, who developed the idea of decision tree ensembles, had his perspective on modeling drastically shift when he worked in the defense industry. So in this way, the historically contingent fact that Bryman worked in defense uh, led to a shift in epistemic values that has persisted to this day. 
So specifically, Ryman uh, proposed this view of data analysis, which de-emphasized the importance of developing probabilistic models of underlying data generating processes and argued that a prediction centered view was the right way to investigate the relationship between response and predictor variables. So his argument was black box algorithmic models can provide more reliable and interesting information than weakly predictive uh, probabilistic models can. He also, sorry. <laughs> Wait, keep going. I was just going to ask how this relates maybe to like positivism or like a larger epistemic, like epistemology that we typically know of. Oh, the like um, the uh, instrumentalism versus not. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, it is a little bit like not super aligned with positivism uh, in some ways, um, but there are, I guess, overlapping and not so over you, it would you would have to like make the case that it's that, that it's like entirely separate this is more just like a we're saying it is instrumentalist versus it's not positivist <laughs> uh, if that makes sense okay um so uh da, 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 da. we were talking about uh right weekly predictive model. oh i see another hand yeah, I was just wondering if um, what I guess what argument you make about how these epistemic values emerged over time and if there were a consequence of like larger scientific epistemic movements over the centuries, or if they were a specific result of, for example, like industry pressures in, over, over the course of the last like few decades as, as machine learning has emerged. Yeah, so the reason I'm not belaboring this point is that it's made by Matthew Jones, like we talked about took this argument from him, right? That that the defense industry and Ryman's time in the defense industry sort of like affected his and the larger machine learning community's um, perspective on uh, what it means to do good science in this area. So yeah, that's why I'm not going into a lot of detail. You, you, you know, that if you're interested in like the, the nuances of this, I highly recommend his paper. Um, but it, it does point to some very interesting writing that Ryman himself did. I hope you can read some of this, but it's, it's kind of interesting. Um, okay, other questions about instrumentalism and what that has to do with Leo Ryman? Okay. Um, so, so yeah, we, we, we this idea from, from Matthew Jones that, that Liam Ryman was, was affected by this instrumentalist point of view because he works, worked in the defense industry. Um, but he also, as some of you may know, uh, pitched one of the first so-called feature importance techniques, uh, which was based on the change in a random forest model's accuracy on the out of bag samples uh, when the feature of interest was scrambled. Um, so, his writing on this is really interesting because even though his personal view, which he wrote about a lot, was that variables were only important if their deletion impacted accuracy, his goal in calculating these importances was not to actually simplify or prune the model if he didn't have to. So he believed the advantage of using trees and ensembles of trees was exactly that it allowed one to avoid doing a feature selection in the first place. So his goal with these metrics was actually to appease people who had interpretability concerns, which he wrote was a secondary goal that could be finessed. So I think this is a really <laughs> interesting sort of, I guess, context to take into account when you're thinking about like, oh, does this feature importance method make sense? Because he is coming at it from this like, oh, like in theory we could prune the model, but why would we actually want to? So I'm just like giving you this number. So anyway, this is a, a, an interesting story that Leif brought to my attention. And um, I guess we use that to argue that this form of feature importance, like much of Ryman's work was born from the, was also born from the value of instrumentalism, uh, the view that the value of a scientific theory is determined by the extent to which it helps to make accurate predictions and to not by an absolute or literal notion of truth. And so while some have taken a stance on whether or not this aligns with feminist theories, uh, we don't really take a stance on that. The point is that this choice is not neutral um, and uh, accuracy sort of centric uh, work um, 
the point that accuracy centric work is not neutral has also been pointed out uh, in, in other settings, uh, in other parts of machine learning, I suppose. So this story of how instrumentalism uh, sort of was the birthplace of feature importance um, led us to question other epistemic values prevalent in the feature importance literature. Any questions on instrumentalism before I move on to the next value? Cool. Lizzie, I have a quick question. What do you mean yeah. by a what do you mean by a value neutral idea? Yeah, so I guess when you when you have a value, it means that thing is valued. <laughs> I, it's sort of a tautological statement, but like, um, if you believe that um, science should be done in a way that helps us make accurate predictions about the future, then you could phrase that as saying, I value instrumentalism. Does that help? <laughs> so value neutral meaning that it doesn't matter? Right. So, okay. So, um, so the fact that the fact that so much of machine learning research is accuracy centric is implying this value. It's not like there are no values at play. Does that? Yeah, that makes sense. Makes sense. Cool. Okay, so the next epistemic value we'll discuss is universalism. So Something that we have been seeing a lot of in the explainable machine learning literature recently uh, is the method of stating some desirable quantitative properties up front, taking these properties to be desirable for all explanations, and then trying to derive explanation methods which satisfy these properties. Um, and this has proved to be a very convincing argument for many people in this field because um, these methods are popular and keep getting used and built upon, especially Shapley values. Like there are just countless papers uh, picking apart <laughs> this uh, way of assigning importance to, to functions at NeurIPS and ICML every year. Uh, and I, there has been also empirical work, I guess, showing that people uh, do use these in practice and in industry as well because of a sort of convenient Python package that's available. So if you're not familiar, the Shapley value is an idea from game theory that allocates the value of a coalitional game among players in accordance with uh, these three axioms. So the idea behind Shapley value explanations is, and, and the details aren't super important here, but the idea behind Shapley value explanations is that a prediction from model can be interpreted as a game, the features can be interpreted as players, and then you want to uh, allocate the value of the prediction among the features, and that becomes the importance. So like how much credit does each feature get in this cooperative setting? So the appeal of Shapley values, at least in my opinion, is that once you impose all three axioms, there's a unique solution to the allocation problem. Uh, but we kind of want to examine the idea push back on the idea that explanation design should really be done this way. So while it's good to be able to say something definitive about the behavior of mathematical tools, the fact that this methodology is valued, so valued in our field may tempt researchers to impose axioms for the sake of imposing axioms in order to arrive at a unique solution. And I really like to highlight this expert excerpt about the uh, third Shapley value axiom additivity from a game theory textbook, which casts doubt on why it tends to be included at all. The authors of the book call it mathematically convenient, but hard to motivate. And this criticism has been around for decades. So I guess the cautionary point that we're making here is not to, which is not to assume that some kind of nice mathematical property will result in useful explanations in this problem setting, where we're evaluating machine learning tools. This is a point that has been made by other papers in the last couple of years, uh, which have supported their points with user studies. So finding that sort of mathematical intuition of what it means for a machine learning model to be interpretable or explainable 
um, doesn't always align with being useful in practice. Which seems, again, like sort of an obvious point, but here we are. Um, so even though this is not a novel criticism, like I said, um, we can connect this point back to our feminist lens um, by saying that the temptation to show that there is a universal or unifying solution to the problem of explanation, which I guess I've called universalism here, is sort of in tension with the value of pluralism, which is a point that has been made in the context of HCI and design, because different qualities of explanations might be desirable in different settings and by different individuals. Questions on this point? So another thing we see valued in the feature importance literature is the tendency to try to explain a model in a vacuum rather than in a real life context when it's operating on real data in realistic application contexts. So one example of this value in action, which um, I think a lot of computer scientists, including myself are guilty of is <laughs> attempting to uh, empirically demonstrate the success in, of some method in a, in a manner that doesn't exactly reflect the reality of how it will actually be used. Um, and to what end. And there are practical you know, considerations as to, to why we don't do perfect user studies every time we build a new tool. Um, but this is still a choice, I guess, in this research community <laughs> that, this, that papers proposing completely theoretical notions of feature importance are still getting submitted, published, and used. Um, another example of this is the proposal of axioms such as um, input invariance or the idea that explanations should be robust to certain transformations of the training data. And uh, finally, I'm gonna kind of just gloss over this point, but many feature importances are calculated by running potentially unrealistic data points or out of distribution samples through a model and sort of reasoning about what the model thinks is important based on how it performs on these unrealistic points. Um, and uh, this includes SHAP, or at least the most popular version of it, as well as other permute and predict methods, such as permutation feature importance, Ryman's feature importance, counterfactual explanations, a lot of uh, sort of explainable machine learning uh, methods have this problem. And what I think these sort of assumptions or techniques all have in common is that they uh, they abstract the explanation method away from the context in which it is being used to impact real human lives. I think it's just so far removed from the task setting that motivates the field of explainable machine learning, which is evaluating, right, the sort of the decision making logic of a tool. Um, and some of these properties can also lead to specific uh, concrete issues. Oh, yes. Yeah. So Lizzie, so I had a so question on the final point of the previous slide. So um, um, so you're saying that there are these models. OK, so, so you're saying that there exists an assumption, and not that you're advocating it, but that there exists an assumption that model can and should be evaluated on this out of, sam uh, out of distribution samples. And, and this is beyond doing a typical cross-validation sort of test train split where that's from distribution, but these are kind of the evaluate on the extreme values sort of thing. It's, it's like the, the extreme case evaluation, not the in-sample evaluation. Yeah, so I guess I think I cite them on this slide. Do I? Yes, okay, yeah. Second bullet point here is about this issue. So, um, this Hooker and Mensch paper, which is stop, please stop permuting features uh, or something along those lines, um, is really interesting and sort of picks apart the potential dangers of interpreting models this way because you sort of, um, the explanations end up to, be, or the, the metrics end up being really biased towards describing the extrapolation behavior of the model because you're like sort of looking at the edge of the actual data's distribution when you're sort of plugging these, these models in, these data points in. 
Um, so I guess to be a little out of order here, uh, there's also a paper showing that uh, this leaves popular feature importance metrics um, sort of vulnerable to adversarial attacks where you could hypothetically build a model that perform that does something completely different on the in distribution and out of distribution um, feature sets as long as it has access to like what the distribution sort of is or has an idea of what those distributions are um, and specifically manipulate the explanations to sort of like say whatever they want. Um, so I had another somewhat maybe not very related question. So I see that most of the things that you mentioned are true, right? Like many of these methods do have this property, uh, but I don't understand why you, why you think that's a bad thing. Right? Like, I mean, uh, so, so they work by, let's say, perturbing and they want certain kinds of invariant property, right? So um, my is internet that, wh wh why is that inherently- It's cutting out a bit. I can't quite hear you. Give me one second. Oh, okay. Can the others hear me, Jeff? Um, okay. Um, yeah, I can hear you. Oh yeah, my video of- uh, Yeah, no, uh, sorry, this is so probably close. me. One minute. Am I back? Uh, yes, so. Cool. All right. Let's let's get the slides set up again and uh, have you repeat your question because I did not get a word of that. <laughs> it's going to be fine, Lizzie. It's just flashbacks from forty one fifty. Yep. Yep. <laughs> I'm sorry to put you through this again. That's yeah. Right. You, one thing that I didn't manage to fix throughout this entire calendar year was. Uh, getting my internet to be more reliable, but oh well, too late now. <laughs> uh, but Aditya, do you want to repeat your question? Well, yes, yeah, yeah, I can do that while, uh, while you're actually setting up. I mean, Great, yeah. You can hear and uh, yeah. So, I mean, I was just asking, right? Like, uh, I mean, uh, I agree with all the points that you showed, right? Like uh, many of these methods do perhaps, uh, uh, like let's say permute features or do something like that. But why do you uh, say that that's necessarily bad? Um, so, I mean, it's, it's not that it's bad. It's just kind of conflicting with the idea that you should evaluate things in the way that they are situated. So, I mean, you, the thing about a lot of these points is that they could be extended to lots of different parts of computer science, not just like machine learning feature importance uh, methods, right? <laughs> so there's- but, um, but, but one could one could argue that in order to actually explain, maybe you have to think of perturbing and doing something, right? Like, I mean, the, the, uh, so for instance, if one were to push us to explain certain things, we might say, hey, look, it can't be some other way. So it has to be this way. Right, so I so guess the point that Hooker and Mensch make in their paper about you know these this information being misleading is that if we go back to like why people think machine learning feature importance methods are important, um, and I guess I you know should have belabored this point more at the beginning of the presentation, but um, it's about uh, you know, helping users of a tool reason about what will happen if they sort of like change the parameters of their input, if they're applying for a loan or something. We're talking about like deciding whether a model is fair or not, whether it's like being influenced by information we don't want it to be influenced by. I just, I feel like this is such a poor formal description of like what the motivations of the, of the notion of machine learning explanations are. And it's this sort of removal and this sort of far too heavy abstraction is the problem here. Oh, I see, I see. Okay. Does yeah, that make that sense? Makes yeah. Sense. I think that example kind of, that, uh, yeah, that makes sense a little bit. Okay. Yeah, so. Because if necessary, yeah, if you're thinking of, let's say, 
just to explain i mean this is what i understood from your explanation like let's say i want to find out if some feature is important for giving a loan or not and maybe these methods say that if i flip this feature um, the model is doing fine so everyone is happy but you're saying that's not necessarily true because flipping the feature might lead to an example that's totally out of distribution so what the model says on it is not really relevant right so yeah i guess this this paper is hard to make a presentation on because like the the point i'm trying to make is that that criticism can be connected to feminism whereas that criticism has already been made in for instance this uh barocas oh, right. yeah, and okay. barocas et al um okay. paper that i'm citing here uh they have a whole paper on why counterfactual explanations are not as useful as they appear and a lot of it has to do with um i guess uh there are assumptions that need to be met for for these uh bits of information to be useful for the user of the tool um and sort of just picking up picking apart the problem description mismatch there so anyway the the sort of loose connection to feminist feminist theory here is that like social context matters we should consider the 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 data that we operate our model on, the people that are involved that are using the tool uh, as part of a larger socio-technical problem setting. And so this is, you know, the, again, this is more, this is a critique of like explainable machine learning broadly, not just of feature uh, importance. I think this is a problem that the entire field kind of has. Um, so does that make a little more sense? Yeah. So I will just sort of briefly mention some of the alternative ways to approach the idea of explanation from a more feminist perspective than the feature importance task. <laughs> um, so one suggestion uh, is to incorporate subjugated points of view when designing tools for understanding systems. Maybe it shouldn't be a pure mathematician you know, coming up with feature importance methods to solve this problem at all. Since no words are not interchangeable, people who are affected by algorithmic systems have a better idea than machine learning researchers about what kinds of tools will help them understand and use those tools, those systems. And I guess an example of where this has been done successfully uh, was pre presented by uh, Mike Cattell at FACT 2020. Um, where participatory methods or a design process, which includes the participation of a certain community, were used to develop an algorithmic accountability toolkit. So this has nothing to do with feature importance because you're, you're coming at the problem from an entirely uh, different way. And I guess I'll note that this idea of participatory machine learning has been explored and has been, I guess, of interest to the machine learning community more broadly. Uh, there was a workshop on it at ICML last year with lots of interesting papers. So definitely check out the proceedings if you're interested in this sort of concept. Um, another suggestion, which again is maybe an obvious one, uh, is to evaluate explanation tools in context. So in evaluating explanation tools in a feminist spirit, we should consider contextual factors that affect how well an explanation can perform its function, uh, such as how stakeholders interpret those explanations, unintended consequences of releasing that information to people, how explanations perform in realistic applications as opposed to toy data sets, and what context exists that could cause an explanation method to fail. Um, finally, HCI research suggests that there might be more interactive ways uh, of creating explanations. Uh, one example that we like to point out is Gamut. It is a visual analytic system that provides an interactive interface to support the interpretation of a specific kind of machine learning model, uh, generalized additive models. Uh, and we believe that interactive explanations would better support the feminist epistemic value of treating the system being studied as an agent rather than a passive object. Another idea that reflects a pluralistic perspective would be to seamfully design explanations. 
So seamless designs are meant to make the usage of a tool seem natural and invisible. Whereas seam full designs make the seam between tool and user more highly visible. So seamful explanations would encourage users to avoid over trusting one interpretation of a machine learning model and keep multiple interpretations in mind. So some concrete ways that explanation researchers could do this is uh, purposefully block the most obvious interpretations of their explanations if they are misleading in some way. So for example, uh, designing feature importance bar charts in a way that reminds users that features might be related or correlated instead of discrete. Um, we could illustrate that explanations are not causal when they do not represent causal quantities because uh, people really like to latch onto that interpretation of these numbers. Um, we could work on ways to communicate the uncertainty the, and downplay the authority of an explanation, um, idea that's received lots of attention in the Viz community lately. Um, and finally, we could design explanations in a way that is ambiguous and actively thwarts a single interpretation, providing multiple positive, plausible accounts of the same phenomenon. So uh, returning to our key questions, I guess we find that looking at the epistemic values implicit in feature importance through a feminist lens highlights the potential weaknesses or failure points of the existing literature, um, which is why we offer directions for the field of explainable AI built on feminist thought. And that's it. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. More questions? So I guess we have time to take lots of questions. So Jeff, go ahead. Um, yeah, yeah. So very interesting. So um, so uh, so I think this explains why I didn't teach feature importance very well in the data ethics courts. Um, so good. So um, so, um, so um, so thank you for the rationalization on that. Uh, um, but but this was interesting. So um, so so one of the last things you said was creating explanations that, um, so, so generate explanations that create a, so a sense of, amb so a sense of ambiguity. Um, I, 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 I'm just trying to kind of understand in principle, like th this seems like kind of important. I, you know, if, if I'm discussing something with with someone and and I don't want to put too much weight on the way I feel, I'll leave some M, M, so um, so I'll so I'll try and leave some ambiguity in how I'm describing it. But when I'm thinking of a tool doing this, I, I you know, I, I feel like if 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 you're creating a technique or a thing, you're um if you leave and you know ambiguity in the tool people might not use it because they don't know what to do with it they might not know how to interpret it and they so I, it, it's just like a strange concept to me like I, like i i feel like i know how to do that in a personal interaction but but part of that is kind of seems like it's gauging feedback from who i'm interacting with when I'm when I'm doing it in a tool I like I don't seem like that would mean have you thought about like in any examples about how you might do this so I can get a handle on this well I mean my first instinct is the hand is off to Daria who has thought a lot about this <laughs> but my mind goes to like um the needle in the New York Times <laughs> and how um you know, it being so far in one way for so much of the night really created this sort of misleading sense of security because people don't understand probability. Um, whereas designing this visually in a way that communicated the uncertainty there might have um, mitigated those. But, but yeah, I guess I don't have an answer to the like, how do you respond to feedback? But Daria, do you have any <laughs> examples of this off the top of your head? <laughs> I mean, I think the needle is a great example, but like key to that is that it like 
pissed people off. Like people were not happy that the needle was vibrating. And the New York Times got a lot of feedback that people hated that design, but it's one of the ways that like we can explore um, not giving the impression that the tools we're building are objective. And I think this is goes back to the feminist theory that Lizzie was talking about is that um, this like God trick is really uh, perpetuated by showing technology as if it's concrete and it is certain and it's the objective truth. So even if we have our users sort of scratching their heads at the end of the day, it might be better than them not scratching their heads. So um, definitely open research question, but it's, it's exciting. Thanks. <laughs> Um, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Okay, cool. I'm in the office for the first time in over a year and just set up my audio without having my normal camera. So, okay. Um, so I, I have like one kind of small technical question that I just want to make sure I'm on the right page. So first, um, you were near mentioning accuracy as kind of the target. I assume that's, that's the same will hold for any sort of standard prediction metric, right? Like precision recall F score, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, because I mean, um, but I'm I'm curious how that kind of plays into the design space too, in terms of like you know there, there are like unbalanced data sets, for example, accuracy is a very bad measure of performance relative to something like an F score, where we can weight you know the recall based on the number of positive versus negative samples we have, say in a binary classifier. Um, yeah, so I would say like all these objective functions are not um, value neutral and and you know, the choice of which one to use for your purposes, you know, implies sort of how you're thinking about the problem and um, like whether you want to prioritize minimizing false positives or something like that. Um, I guess you can imagine like in a, like you are deciding whether to put someone in jail. Maybe false positives are like the worst possible thing that you could have. Uh, in this uh, in this scenario, maybe that maybe that like minimizing those is like your priority. So I, I mean, in this sort of sense, like choosing an objective function is with respect to your task, uh, sort of embeds your values in uh, how you, I guess, the way in which you conceive the task. Okay. Yeah. Does that make sense. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. And I, I just. Uh... That's obvious now that you explained it so nicely. Um, the other kind of question I have, and maybe it's not even a, a super well-formed question yet, but you know, I've read a lot of Bryman's writing, not just like his technical writing, but like he, he wrote a lot, right, about like what he was doing. And it, and it is kind of interesting that, you know, he's actually, uh, you know, like ensembles, for example, in neural networks are now becoming a more common tool for explicitly, you know, ironically to your talk title, like measuring epistemic uncertainty. Uh, and I'm curious, like you were talking about this, like out of distribution data testing, right? These are one way of trying to measure, um, you know, if a target or if, if a sample that we're evaluating is out of distribution, right? Is if do, do we have high epistemic uncertainty, meaning that it's, you know, some data point that um, is low probability from the training data set that we that we created. And because I'm, I mean, are you familiar with this concept? Um... I mean, the way you're describing it, yes, I, di I didn't know it was referred to as epistemic. Yeah, so, so, I think it's kind of an overloaded term, maybe. <laughs> so, I mean, it's explicitly, I mean, it's, it's obvious, it, I mean, it's the same etymology. It's the knowledge of the learned model relative to the training data. So that's why it's epistemic uncertainty versus what we would call aleatoric or, or systematic uh, uncertainty, which is the uncertainty inherent in the problem. So imagine like, I have an actual stochastic process I'm trying to learn, like there's some stochasticity there that I want my model to capture. Uh, and that's kind of a different class of, of uncertainty. So this has been, you know, a popular topic for the past two or three years in kind of the neural network field. Um, and, you know, it's, it's very important to the things we do where we have a lot of both kinds of uncertainty in, in the physical world. Um, so, <clears throat> so it seems like that is a useful tool. And it seems like this is actually a tool that Brian, you know, cared a lot about, like you were saying, like with kind of the limit of the, the features so like he doesn't want to get rid of features, right? Uh, and I guess my question then is like, you were saying that like everything matters in the social context. So like, if we take that like to the extreme, it's like, oh, we actually should be adding features 
as much as possible, right? We like it's probably that there's something hidden that we don't know about that would be helpful. And then, but then counterfactual reasoning, which is like the typical way that this is trying to be uncovered, like is there some lingering confound? Uh, you know, you're also criticizing. So I'm curious, like, do you have thoughts there about like how are there ways that we can go about thinking? Is there more features that we need to be adding? You know, that, that aren't even available in the input space that, that's being trained on. Yeah, that's that's a good point. Um, so something that uh, one of the papers we cite brings up, it's the um, Barocas et al. So, so Solon Barocas and one of his students at Cornell and Andrew Selps, a lawyer, um, have written this paper, wrote this paper for fact last year um, that was about the hidden assumptions of counterfactual reasoning. And I guess the, the conclusion they kind of came to was like, yes, you need more and more information to know whether a, an explanation is gonna be useful, right? Like the more information you have, the better you can reason about whether it's going to like help a person. So the more context uh, you have provided, um, but then this creates this tension between, uh, I guess, how do they describe it? There's like a privacy issue at a certain point um, and like, at, and a, a power dynamic there because um, the person who's like constructing this explanation for you is needs to take all this information in about you. Um, so I don't remember exactly the point that they made there, um, but I guess there is a tension between those two things is what I got from that. <laughs> I don't know if that answers your question exactly. I, mean, I, think, but... I, mean, I think it, it makes, I think it raises an interesting point, which is like the, just the, we need to be upfront about the fundamental explanation, like that these tools are potentially like not possible to capture certain values, right? Yeah. That, that in the extreme, right, where you need to get all this information to know this one instance perfectly, then like a machine learning model is completely useless because the entire yes. point of it is to generalize knowledge to unseen examples, right? And so maybe that's the bigger lesson for me from, from all of this. <laughs> Possibly, yes. <laughs> that that's very true. And something I've been thinking a lot about was separate from this work. <laughs> cool, so, thanks. Yeah. So are you saying we should stop using machine learning? No. <laughs> uh, maybe for certain things. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Yeah, any other questions? <laughs> this is probably a very, maybe not an optimal place to stop, or <laughs> note to stop <laughs> one. <laughs> I, I will advocate that we should stop using machine learning for most things we're using in machine learning. For, um, for most go. things, okay. Um, now that I have it, now that I have more. Except for robots, right, Tucker? Yeah, yeah, yeah. robots. Robots, <laughs> robots are fine, yeah. yeah. <laughs> because oh, they yeah, need Chris? Their, their Chris. I was wondering if you think that these kinds of new like epistemic approaches might, because um, I, th I think most of us are already thinking about the ways that these approaches might indict the ways that we use machine learning today in certain fields and contexts. But I'm wondering if perhaps it could also open up other avenues um, for applications that maybe weren't thought of before with these new feature important evaluations. And I was wondering if you have any thoughts or meditations on the ways that rejecting our current mode of our, our current epistemic status quo in favor of a, new, of a new one might actually lead to new applications in places that we wouldn't have otherwise considered. Applications of machine learning, you mean? Or yeah, yeah, of machine learning in, part, uh, in particular, but maybe just, major, maybe just feature selection in, in all kinds of statistical modeling. Hmm. Uh, um, so Nothing original comes to mind, but what your comment does um, remind me of a different paper at FACT 2020 that was about studying up, um, which is an idea from anthropology. I, I think it, I mean, it must be related to this in some way because it's all like critical theory stuff. But um, <laughs> basically the idea is that like, um, by studying something, and like building models about something, you're kind of asserting a power over it. And so by inverting power relations um, and studying the people in power themselves, you can kind of uh, flip that equation. So the, the obvious example or the canonical example from that talk is like, 
instead of predict predicting um, like who should go to jail, maybe we should be predicting which judges are going to be racist uh, or something like that. So I, I think that was a sort of like useful narrative flipping uh, talk um, slash paper. I didn't, I don't think I read the paper, but I, I like the talk. So maybe there are some ideas on that in there. <laughs> That's a more positive note, don't you think? <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. So any other questions, uh, students or uh, yeah, anyone else? Um, I had just sort of one, one thought which, which came to mind. This reminds me a little bit of, of the, um, I guess maybe platitudes or whatever. One, one person's trash is another person's treasure or one person's signal is another person's noise. And what mm. you're talking here with the value judgment on, on what's important or mean to be important seems to, to fit into a lot of that. And so one of my takeaways is that maybe it's making sure to pay attention to the assumptions that I'm making and to not just make the same assumptions for every context that I go into, but to make sure that it's still kind of appropriate for that context. Yep, that's definitely, I guess, what we hoped the takeaway would be. So <laughs> great. So thanks, right, everyone. Sounds great. I think. Uh...